What are 10 hidden gems in Rome that most people don't know about? Keep watching and we'll take you off the beaten track to visit 10 of our favorite attractions in Rome that most tourists never get to see. Hey, we're not telling you to skip those famous tourist attractions like the Colosseum or the Trevi Fountain. Of course you should go and see them. But if you want to see Rome on a deeper level, if you want to have a truly unforgettable trip to Italy, then you should definitely check out some of these hidden gems. We'll show you where to get a tasty, inexpensive lunch surrounded by locals, where Julius Caesar was assassinated, and where the Beatles took an impromptu dip in a fountain. Okay, so we're ready. Let's go. Let's go. If you're an art lover, like me, or even if you're an art liker, like Ed, or even if you're just sort of ho-hum about art, the Borghese Gallery and Gardens is definitely a must-see museum if you come to Rome. It's a veritable treasure trove of sculpture and paintings from the Renaissance and Baroque period that will surprise and delight you. The villa was commissioned by Cardinal Scipione Borghese in the 17th century, and it houses masterpieces by Raphael, the Deposition of Christ, for example, Titian, Sacred and Profane Love, Caravaggio, David with the head of Goliath, and Bernini, shown here in a self-portrait. I love Caravaggio and Raphael, but for me, the real stars of the show here are Bernini's sculptures. In particular, there are three that I just think are amazing. One is David, and if you look at his face, you can see just the unbelievable concentration and determination in the set of his jaw and the look on his face. Another one is the Rape of Persephone. The detail is just amazing. For example, here you can see how Zeus's fingers are actually indenting the the flesh of Persephone. I mean, it's just amazing. It looks so real. And then finally, there's Apollo and Daphne. It's just amazing. And it really captures the moment when she is transformed from a woman into a laurel. Behind the building is a beautiful garden. Because we were here in February, we didn't visit it. But if you're here in nice weather, you certainly should. But be aware, you need a separate ticket to visit the gardens. The gardens are open every day. But beware, the villa is closed on Monday. Right in the heart of Rome, not too far from the Pantheon, is the Largo di Argentina, an archeological site that unveils layers of history all the way from the Roman Empire up until present day. Surrounded by modern buildings and sitting a few feet below street level are several very well-preserved temples dating back to the third and fourth centuries BC. Beyond the fact that the Largo of Argentina is thousands of years old, there are two other very interesting things about it. One, this is where Julius Caesar was assassinated on the Ides of March 44 BC, as immortalized in Shakespeare's play. The second is that in addition to being an open air museum, the Largo di Argentina actually serves as a sanctuary for Rome's feline population. And in fact, thousands of stray and abandoned cats make this their home and they are protected and fed by volunteers. However, note that feeding the cats by the general public is prohibited. If you want an authentic taste of Rome, don't miss a visit to the Testaccio Marketplace. It's a foodie's paradise with all types of ready-to-eat food and the nicest produce you've ever seen from all over Italy. It's been around since the 19th century, but it moved to its present location in 2012. Here there are over a hundred stalls and the locals come here to do their shopping every day for produce, fresh fish, meats, cheeses, homemade pasta, and lots of other things. Now, if you're not here shopping for ingredients to cook with, you definitely should come anyway and eat some of the wonderful prepared foods that are available. Some of the local favorites include piadine, which are flatbed wraps stuffed with tasty ingredients, suppli, which are rice croquettes stuffed with mozzarella and tomato, and of course you'll be tempted by many types of pizza and pasta. If you're here to shop for ingredients, in particular produce, just a word of warning, don't touch the produce. It's considered very bad form. Just point to what you want and a shopkeeper will get it for you. 
The Baths of Caracalla are one of the largest remaining public baths from the Roman Empire. It was completed about 216 BC and remained in use until the 6th century. It was severely damaged by an earthquake in 847, and then much of the materials were carted off for use in construction and other places, but much of the structure remains. Public baths were a really big deal back in the days of the Roman Empire, and they served two important purposes. One of them was hygiene, of course, people had to get clean. But the other purpose it served was one of socialization and relaxation. And this sprawling complex of over 62 acres included everything from gymnasiums to shops to libraries. In fact, there were two libraries, one that had Latin text and one with Greek text. It had swimming pools. It had all sorts of different rooms, including a cold bath, a hot bath, and a warm bath. And these baths could accommodate 1,600 bathers at one time. You know, I always hate it when libraries mix Greek and Latin text. I just think it's inappropriate. Can you believe it? I think they should all be in there together along with the French and the Spanish and the Italian. <laughs> It was decorated with mosaics, frescoes, carvings, and statues, many of which are still there today, and many others are in museums. The building's design is considered so perfect that it was used as the inspiration for New York's Pennsylvania Station and the Senate Building in Ottawa, Canada. Who knew? Not me. The Aventine Keyhole is one of Rome's smallest attractions because it's a keyhole, but it offers a unique perspective on St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. So you get this view by peeking through the keyhole in this unassuming green door, which is the entrance to the Knights of Malta. As you look through the keyhole, you look down an avenue of trees and perfectly framed in the distance is the dome of St. Peter's. It really is pretty cool. Yeah, it is. If you've been to Rome before, you've probably thrown a coin into the famous Trevi Fountain. But few know that right around the corner is another amazing site, the Vicus Caprarius, or the City of Water. It's an underground archaeological site that sits 30 feet below street level. Roman engineering was very advanced with long aqueducts and underground channel. Here you get a glimpse of the city's ancient water infrastructure. Discovered in the late 20th century by chance during some building construction, it consists of a network of tunnels and channels dating back to the first century AD. These underground channels served as a distribution network for the local houses and buildings. The site gets its name Caprarius for the Latin word capra, meaning she-goat, because of a mosaic that was found in, during the excavation. While not as well known as some of the above-ground landmarks, the Vicus Caprarius adds a whole other layer to this rich history of the Eternal City. It shows us about the ingenuity of the early inhabitants. The Villa Farnesina was built between 1506 and 1510 for the wealthy banker Agostino Chigi, who was the banker to the Pope. It was designed by the famous architect Baldassare Peruzzi. What makes it so special isn't just the building, but the fact that its interior is adorned by original and well-preserved frescoes by Raphael and other important Renaissance artists. On the ground floor, Raphael's Triumph of Galatea depicts the mythological love story between Achis and Galatea. Another Raphael work is the vaulted ceiling of the Loggia of Cupid and Psyche, which depicts the forbidden romance between the divine god of desire and a mortal princess. The upstairs is decorated by frescoes by many other famous artists. One of my favorite things was a trompe l'oeil depicting a loggia and beyond it the city and the countryside. That was cool. Outside the villa is a garden with many species of citrus tree, and some of them have some pretty funky looking <laughs> fruits that you probably have never seen before. So it's worth taking a stroll around the garden if the weather's nice, or take a load off and have a seat and relax away from the hustle and bustle of the city. If you're up for something a little bit macabre, you can visit the crypt of the Capuchin Church of Santa Maria de la Concepcione. Constructed in the 17th century, the crypt contains the skeletal remains of 3,700 friars, all with, where their bones are all arranged in artistic and decorative patterns. Very weird. Yes. You have to pass through the museum to get to the crypt, which is divided into different chapels, each with a theme, like the chapel of the pelvises, <laughs> of the arm bones, of the skull. It's a quite different kind of place. That it is. A plaque in one of the chapels, written in five languages, gives the church's message for the crypt, which is, what you are now 
we once were. What we are now, you shall be. That's heavy stuff. Mark Twain had a little different take. He visited it in 1867 and then wrote in his 1869 book, Innocence Abroad, his impression of the crypt. The reflection that the capuchin flyer must someday be taken apart like an engine or a clock and worked up into arches and pyramids and hideous frescoes did not disturb this monk in any way. I thought he even looked as if he were thinking with complacent vanity that his own skull would look well on the top of the heap and his own ribs add a charm to the frescoes which possibly they lacked at present. We spent one Sunday afternoon riding bikes on the Appian Way, or the Via Appia. This was one of the most important roads connecting Rome to the rest of its empire. And it's really cool to do this on a Sunday because they actually close the Appian Way to traffic. And so walkers, cyclists, and even horseback riders have the whole Appian Way to themselves on Sunday afternoon. And when we went, even though it was January, the weather was absolutely spectacular. It was an absolutely gorgeous day, and riding bikes was a terrific change from the normal sightseeing activities that we had been doing. In fact, I would say that of all the things we did in Rome on this past visit, this was kind of one of my favorites. While I love history, I have to disagree with Anne. This is one of my least favorite things to do. And it had nothing to do with the Appian Way. The bicycle rental company gave me a bike that was way too small. So every time I tried to pedal, my knees hit my chin. <laughs> I wouldn't want this to dissuade you from having the experience. Just make sure you get a bike that fits. Yeah, get a good bike. Get there early. The Appian Way is really old. It dates back to 312 BC and was originally constructed primarily for military purposes. And eventually it extended about 300 miles all the way to Brindisi on the coast. As you ride or walk, you'll be able to see the remains of a bunch of temples and other Roman structures from that period. It's really cool to think that you're walking or riding along the same path that Julius Caesar traveled back in the day. And in fact, the other cool thing is you can actually see the imprints of the chariot wheels in the stones as you're walking along. So those those paving stones are actually the very same ones that have been there for thousands of years. Now that is really cool. Another interesting fact, if you've ever heard of Spartacus, made famous by the 1960s movie or most recent TV series, it was on the Appian Way where this famous slave leader was crucified in 71 BC. One of Rome's hidden gems, the Quartiere Copede, is actually a residential neighborhood on the north side of Rome, not too far from a lot of the foreign embassies. The neighborhood was designed and built between 1915 and 1927 by the famous architect Gino Copede. It's a whimsical world of about 40 houses decorated with sculptures, mosaics, and whimsical motifs. At the entrance just off the Via Taliamento, uh, in the archway is an opulent chandelier outside and it looks quite impressive. Across the piazza, look for the Palazzo del Ragno, or Palace of the Spider, which is guarded by sculptures that look like spiders. <laughs> then in front of you, in the center of Piazza Mincio, is the focal point of the entire area, which is a big fountain adorned by 12 delightful frogs. It was in this fountain, back in 1965, that the Beatles decided to take a dip in the fountain just after they finished a performance at a nearby club. The locals were not amused and refused to provide towels. We had a great time exploring and visiting these unique sites. Have you ever been to any of them? Let us know in the comments below which was your favorite. And if you haven't been to any of them, let us know which one you would like to visit. And don't forget to like and subscribe so you can see more videos like this. But if you can't wait to see another of our exciting videos, there are a couple that are magically appearing on the screen right now. Check them out because you'll find some useful info for your next trip to Italy. I hope we have some in there. I hope we do. I hope they look at it. I hope they do too.